I left Great Salt Lake a good deal confused as to what state of things existed there, and sometimes even questioning in my own mind whether a state of things existed there at all or not. But presently I remembered with a lightning sense of relief that we had learned two or three trivial things there which we, we could be certain of. And so the two days were not wholly lost. For instance, we had learned that we were at last in a pioneer land, in absolute and tangible reality. The high prices charged for trifles were eloquent of high freights and bewildering distances of freightage. In the East in those days, the smallest money denomination was a penny, and it represented the smallest purchasable quantity of any commodity. West of Cincinnati, the smallest coin in use was the silver five cent piece and no smaller quantity of an article could be bought than five cents worth. In Overland City, the lowest coin appeared to be the ten cent piece. But in Salt Lake, there did not seem to be any money in circulation smaller than a quarter, or any smaller quantity purchasable of any commodity than twenty-five cents worth. We had always been used to half dimes and five cents worth as a minimum of financial negotiation. But in Salt Lake, if one wanted a cigar, it was a quarter. If he wanted a chalk pipe, it was a quarter. If he wanted a peach, or a candle, or a newspaper, or a shave, or a little genteel whiskey to rub on his corns to arrest indigestion and keep him from having the toothache, 25 cents was the price every time. When we looked at the shot bag of silver now and then, we seemed to be wasting our substance in riotous living. But if we referred to the expense account, we could see that we had not been doing anything of the kind. But people easily get reconciled to big money and big prices, and fond and vain of both. It is a decent it is a descent to little coins and cheap prices that is hardest to bear, and slowest to take hold upon one's toleration. After a month's ac acquaintance with the twenty five cent minimum, the average human being is ready to blush every time he thinks of his despicable five cent days. How sunburnt with blushes I used to get in gaudy Nevada every time I thought of my first financial experience in Salt Lake. It was on this wise, which is a favorite expression of great authors, and a very neat one too, but I never hear anybody say on this wise when they are talking. A young half-breed with a complexion like a yellow jacket asked me if I would have my boots blackened. It was at the Salt Lake house the morning after we arrived. I said yes, and he blacked, blacked them and I handed him a silver five cent piece with the benevolent air of a person who is conferring wealth and blessedness upon poverty and suffering. The yellow jacket took it with what I judged to be suppressed emotion and laid it reverently down in the middle of his broad hand. Then he began to contemplate it, much as a philosopher contemplates a gnat's ear in the ample field of his microscope. Several mountaineers, teamsters, stage drivers, etc., drew near and dropped into the tableau and fell to surveying the money with that attractive indifference to formality which is noticeably in the hardy pine which is noticeable in the hardy pioneer. Presently the yellow jacket handed the half dime back to me and told me I ought to keep my money in my pocketbook instead of in my soul, and then I wouldn't get it cramped and shriveled up so. What a roar of vulgar laughter there was! What a roar of vulgar laughter there was! I destroyed the mongrel reptile on the spot, but I smiled and smiled all the time I was detaching his scalp, for the remark he made was good for an Injun. Yes, we had learned in Salt Lake to be charged great prices without letting the inward shudder appear on the surface, for even already. We had overheard and noted the tenor of conversations among drivers, conductors, and hostlers, and finally among citizens of Salt Lake, until we were well aware that these superior beings despised immigrants. We permitted no telltale shudders and winces in our countenances, for we wanted to seem pioneers or Mormons, half-breeds, teamsters, stage drivers, mountain meadow assassins, anything in the world that the Plains and Utah represented and admired. But we were wretchedly ashamed of being immigrants, and sorry enough that we had white shirts and could not swear in the presence of ladies without looking the other way. And many a time in Nevada afterwards, we had occasion to remember with humiliation 
that we were immigrants and consequently a low and inferior sort of creatures. Perhaps the reader has visited Utah, Nevada, or California even in these later days. And while communing with himself upon the sorrowful banishment of those countries from what he considers the world, has had his wings clipped by finding that he is the one to be pitied. And that there are entire populations around him ready and willing to do it for him, ye who are complacently doing it for him already, wherever he steps his foot. Poor thing, they are making fun of his hat and the cut of his New York coat and his conscientiousness about his grammar and his feeble profanity and his consumingly ludicrous ignorance of oars, shafts, tunnels, and other things which he never saw before and never felt enough interest in to read about. And all the time that he is thinking what a sad fate it is to be exiled to the, that far country, that lonely land, the citizens around him are looking down on him with a blighting compassion because he is an immigrant instead of that proudest and blessedest creature that exists on all the earth, a 49er. The accustomed coach life began again now, and by midnight it almost seemed as if we never had been out of our snuggery among the mail sacks at all. We had made one alteration, however. We had provided enough bread, boiled ham, and hard-boiled eggs to last double the 600 miles of staging we had still to do and it was comfort in those succeeding days to sit up and contemplate the majestic panorama of mountains and valleys spread out below us and eat ham and hard-boiled eggs while our spiritual natures reveled alternately in rainbows, thunderstorms, and peerless sunsets. Nothing helps scenery like ham and eggs. Ham and eggs and after these a pipe, an old, rank, delicious pipe. Ham and eggs and scenery, a downgrade, a flying coach, a fragrant pipe, and a contented heart. These make happiness. It is what all the ages have struggled for. Chapter 18, Alkali Desert, Romance of Crossing Dispelled, Alkali Dust, Effect on the Mules, Universal Thanksgiving. At eight in the morning we reached the remnant and ruin of what had been the important military station of Camp Floyd, some 45 or 50 miles from Salt Lake City. At 4 p.m. we had doubled our distance and were 90 or 100 miles from Salt Lake, and now we entered upon one of that species of desert deserts whose concentrated hideousness shames the diffused and diluted horrors of Sahara, an alkali desert. For 68 miles, there was but one break in it. I do not remember that this was really a break. Indeed, it seems to me that it was nothing but a watering depot in the midst of the stretch of 68 miles. If my memory serves me, there was no well or spring at this place, but the water was hauled there by mule and ox teams from the farther side of the desert. There was a stage station there, it was 45 miles from the beginning of the desert and 23 from the end of it. We plowed and dragged and groped along the whole live long night. And at the end of this uncomfortable 12 hours, we finished the 45 mile part of the desert and got to the stage station where the imported water was. The sun was just rising. It was easy enough to cross a desert in the night while we were asleep and it was pleasant to reflect in the morning that we, an actual person, had encountered an absolute desert and could always speak knowingly of deserts in presence of the ignorant thenceforward. And it was pleasant also to reflect that this was not an obscure backcountry desert, but a very celebrated one, the metropolis itself, as you may say. All this was very well and very comfortable and satisfactory, but now we were to cross a desert in daylight. This was fine, novel, romantic, dramatically adventurous. This, indeed, was worth living for, worth traveling for. We would write home all about it. This enthusiasm, enthusiasm this stern thirst for adventure, wilted under the sultry August sun, did not last above one hour. One poor little hour, 
And then we were ashamed that we had gushed so. The poetry was all in the anticipation. There is none in the reality. Imagine a vastness, waveless ocean, stricken dead and turned to ashes. Imagine this solemn waste tucked with ash-dusted sagebrushes. Imagine the lifeless silence and solitude that belong to such a place. Imagine a coach creeping like a bug through the midst of this shoreless level and sending up tumbled volumes of dust as if it were a bug that went by steam. Imagine this aching monotony of toiling and plowing kept up hour after hour, and the shore is still as far away as ever. Apparently, imagine a team, driver, coach, and passengers so deeply coated with ashes that they are all one colorless color. Imagine ash drifts roosting above mustaches and eyebrows like snow accumulations on bows and bushes. This is the reality of it. The sun beats down with dead, blistering, relentless malignity. The perspiration is welling from every pore in man and beast, but scarcely a sign of it finds its way to the surface. It is absorbed before it gets there. There is not the faintest breath of air stirring. There is not a merciful shred of cloud in all the brilliant firmament. There is not a living creature visible in any direction whither one searches the blank level that stretches its monotonous miles on every hand. There is not a sound, not a sigh, not a whisper, not a buzz, or a whir of wings, or a distant pipe of bird, not even a sob from the lost souls that doubtless people the dead air. And so the occasional sneezing of the resting mules and the champing of the bits grate harshly on the grim stillness, not dissipating the spell, but accenting it, and making one feel more lonesome and forsaken than before. The mules, under violent swearing, coaxing, and whip-cracking, would make at stated intervals a spurt, and drag the coach a hundred or maybe two hundred yards, stirring up a billowy cloud of dust that rolled back enveloping the vehicle to the wheel tops or higher, and making it seem afloat in a fog. Then a rest followed, with the usual sneezing and bit champing, then another spurt of a hundred yards and another rest at the end of it. All day long we kept this up, without water for the mules, and without ever changing the team. At last, at least we kept it up ten hours, which I take it is a day and a pretty honest one in, in an alkali desert. It was from four in the morning till two in the afternoon, and it was so hot and so close, and our water canteens went dry in the middle of the day, and we got so thirsty. It was so stupid and tiresome and dull, and the tedious hours did lag and drag and limp.